this is lecture what 12 okay so the last class we, we saw some uh, basically i think i was spending quite a bit of time with mpam to establish the decision regions and come up with some expression for the probability of error okay so the mpam that we were looking at i want to do it a little bit i think towards the end i was rushing a little bit so i want to do it uh, more carefully this time okay so mpam okay so you have zero and the way i took it it was d by 2 right 3d by 2 so on till m minus 1 d by 2 okay so minus d by 2 minus 3d by 2 so on till minus m minus 1 d by 2 that's my mpam constellation okay and the decision regions are fairly simple okay for the outer points you have two different to a, a, a certain type of a decision region and for the okay and for the inner points you have a certain so finite decision region okay so that's clear enough so what i'm going to write down so I, I did some calculations to show how probability of error given a certain transmission point is simply an integral over the decision region well probability of correct decision is an integral over the decision region probability of error will be 1 minus integral over that decision region okay so i'm going to do that now so suppose you say x is say m minus 1 d by 2 okay so you have to take an integral over the decision region for the conditional pdf right so that's what i want to find out okay i want to find probability of error conditional on x equals m minus 1 into d by 2 okay so for that what will the conditional pdf look like okay so this is the conditional pdf f y given x equals m minus 1 d by 2 y how will the conditional pdf look like it will be a normal centered at m minus 1 d by 2 and variance will be n naught by 2 okay so that's how the so roughly maybe it looks like this okay the peak will occur here and what is my decision region m minus 2 d by 2 onwards to the right okay so that's my decision region okay so this point would be well that's not a constellation point but that is my so what is this distance d by 2 okay so that's what's important all this m minus 1 m minus 2 and all that is just convenient notation for denoting the point what's crucial is this distance okay so because the reason is i want this integral which is the probability of correct decision but then what will be the probability of error the other integral okay so the other integral is much easier to write using q functions once you know the distance from the mean okay so you see easily probability of error given given x equals m minus 1 d by 2 equals what integral from minus infinity to m minus 2 d by 2 the normal pdf with mean m minus 1 d by 2 and variance n naught by 2 okay so you can either use one of your standard formulas or you can do a change of variables convert it into a suitable unit Gaussian and then find the actual distance there you can do that work and show this is equal to q d by 2 root n naught by 2 okay so root n naught by 2 is the standard deviation and d by 2 is the distance from the mean this will work out as q d by 2 divided by root n naught by 2 okay so okay so if you want uh, if you want a useful trick to remember this the way to the way to remember this is the following for instance the general formula for q gives you something for the unit normal unit variant zero mean unit normal uh, pdf okay so maybe you, you don't have that maybe in a general situation you have say mean mu naught and then variance say sigma squared okay so i don't know why i'm saying mu naught i'll just say mu okay mean mu and variance sigma square okay so q will give you suppose you have this to be a general i don't know some alpha okay so, right the integral from alpha to infinity of this pdf 
will work out to what? Q alpha minus mu divided by sigma. Okay, so this is the formula. Okay, right? So if I pick some beta here and ask you for this integral, what will it be? Yeah. Okay, is that clear? Q of beta minus nu. This one minus. I'm sorry. What will it work out to? Yeah, okay. So that integral should also work out to something very similar. I don't know why I'm uh, struggling a little bit here. What will this work out to? Minus infinity to beta normal nu sigma squared. Okay. So you can write this as 1 minus integral from yeah, beta to infinity normal mu sigma squared. Okay. Is this working out okay? Am I writing it fine? Okay, so finally I think the correct answer will have to work out to Q of mu minus beta by sigma. Okay. Right? Is this fine? Okay. So there will be a half term missing, so you should use Q of 0 as half and all that. Okay, so it involves a little bit more of work. I thought it would be a very simple derivation. But anyway, you see. This will have to work out to Q of mu minus beta by sigma. Is that clear? Okay, if you want, you can show you can show this. This you can write this as uh, Q of beta minus mu, but then it will be negative. The Q of minus x is half plus Q of plus x and all that. Okay, so you do that, you'll get this answer. Okay, so so play around with this. So these are the two expressions to remember. Okay, so these two are the expressions to remember. So what matters here? You see, notice alpha minus mu is what? What is this alpha minus mu? It's this distance, right? Deviation from the mean. Likewise, what is beta minus mu? Mu minus beta is deviation from the mean. Okay, whenever you're calculating what's called the tail probability, what matters, you can write this as Q of deviation from mean divided by standard deviation. Okay, that's for the tail probability. Okay, if you're calculating the other probability, it'll be 1 minus the tail probability. So this is useful to write everything in terms of Q. Okay, that's one uh, expression. Okay. You can also use this to write integral from beta to alpha of the normal PDF. What will this be? Okay, so anyway, this is an assignment for you. Okay, try this. It's not too difficult. Write it in terms of the Q function. Okay, so it's, it's okay to write. All right. Okay, so that's the that's the probability. Let me go back once again to that page and remind you what we got. This is conditional on transmitting one of the rightmost extreme points probability of error given x equals m minus 1 d by 2 this has to be equal to q of d by 2 divided by root n naught by 2 okay all right so you see you see once again the formula at work okay so what's the distance from i mean i'm interested in this tail probability right and what is the distance from the deviation from the mean it's d by 2 and divided by c Okay, so use that. It's, it's easy to work this out. Okay. All right. So the next thing is to look at probability of error conditional on the other extreme point. This is very easy. What should it be? Should also be the exact same thing. Q of d by two divided by root and not by two. Okay. So then. I'm going to argue now I'll do for one interior point and everything else will be the same. Okay, so I will do probability of error conditional on x equals d by 2. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. Let's draw the conditional PDF. This is fy given uh, x. I think I've been using all kinds of different notation. Okay, hopefully it's clear to you. Right? It's going to be mean d by 2 and variance root n naught by 2. And what's the probability that I'm interested in? I'm actually interested in two probabilities, uh, two, two different areas. One is this area, okay? And what's the other area? After d, right? So I'm interested in this area. Okay, so you can visualize this from various points of view from the constellation. If you see, if, you're, if you transmit d by 2, 
if your y is less than 0 then you are closer to minus d by 2 if your if your y is greater than d then you are closer to 3 times d by 2 in both cases you will make an error okay so i am interested in the integral over that area what is that integral going to be there are two tail probabilities right so it's going to be q of but you notice the distance is the same okay the deviation from the mean is same for both right d by 2 so it's going to be 2 times q d by 2 by root n not by 2 is that okay right a simple enough uh, formula okay so now that we have found the conditional pdfs we can find the probability of error itself okay so how many extreme points do i have i have two of them okay so it's, and, and they occur with probability 2 by m 2 by m q d by 2 by root n not by 2 plus what m minus 2 by m q of okay this is a 2 i'm sorry 2 q of d by 2 divided by root n not by 2 okay it's a simple simplification from this point to show this will be the same as 2 times 1 minus m q d by 2 divided by root n not by 2 is that okay Is that right? Is it, is it okay? All right. So this argument of Q is quite important to me. Okay. So for M, when M is large or even if for any M, what's outside the Q is not going to matter that much because it's a constant. It doesn't change if I change my power at the transmitter. It doesn't change if I change my bandwidth. It doesn't change if I change any of my other parameters. Right. So remember, why did I calculate probability of error? I want to understand all the trade-offs very carefully. What's the trade-off between power of the transmitter, bandwidth of the transmitter and all that. Okay. So bandwidth turns out we can't really understand. Okay. So I, I was trying to write down expected value of n square of t, but it turns out since we assumed a huge bandwidth that doesn't make much sense. Okay. So we simply define uh, something based on n naught and we'll proceed for, for now. Later on I'll fix the bandwidth thing. So for now we'll, we'll ignore the bandwidth part of it. I want to understand how the power of the transmitter and power of the noise. Okay, power of the noise is represented simply by n naught, the level of the noise. All these things trade off and give you an expression for probability of error. That's what I want to understand, right? So I should clearly look at this expression very closely and figure out what is important and what's not important. Okay, outside on the left hand side you have coefficients which don't change when any of those things change. When will it change? When m changes, right? When m changes, it will change. Okay, why is m crucial for me? What does m determine? number of symbols or the rate okay the bit rate is going to be determined by m okay so that's a, that's an expression which you might want to write down so so maybe i'm sorry let me just write it down here i don't want to lose focus of this uh, on this expression it's quite important okay so this log base 2m is the bits per symbol okay so m is crucial but you see I don't have to worry too much about it. Why is it that I don't have to worry too much about it? Yeah, so as one, one reason is that when m is large, you can definitely ignore it. It's no problem. But also, look at the other term multiplying it. It's q. Okay, q is going to decrease exponentially in its argument. Okay, and for any reasonable value for its argument, it's going to be far, far smaller than this expression. And you can conveniently not care too much about it. Up to some order, you can find the expression just with q. Okay, so q is very important. Okay, what whatever shows up inside Q as an argument of Q is extremely crucial for me. And whatever design I do, I do in my transmitter and receiver, I should take care of that argument. Whatever shows up inside my Q is what's going to give me my performance. Okay, so that quantity is extremely crucial. Okay, so hopefully you're convinced of that. Okay, nothing else appears in the probability of error. Only thing that matters is what's this argument of Q. Okay, so we're going to look at that argument of Q very very closely and come up with some uh, expressions for it and related to the various quantities that we are interested in okay that's what we'll do okay all right so let's let's see the, what what shows up inside is d but d is a little bit misleading the reason is uh, what we are more interested in is in transmit power and yeah d is also related to 
the transmit power okay so I, I i think i wrote down this relation yesterday but i may not remember it very exactly so signal energy es worked out to what some m squared minus 1 d squared by 12 am i right okay okay so you notice this is this is very interesting so this on the left hand side you have energy of the signal on the right hand side you have two quantities that are of very great importance to you the quantity d which is the minimum distance in your constellation which plays a crucial role inside my argument of q which determines my probability of error and then also m which is related to my rate okay and the next quantity is n0 by 2 i'm going to make a definition and say en is n0 by 2 like i said at this point i can't exactly relate it what is n0 by 2 n0 by 2 worked out as expected value of n squared some n squared what is that n after the correlation okay so it's not clear what it relates to in terms of n of t okay the only thing i can say is it's the level of the power spectral density okay so just take it as a level of the power spectral density for now okay later on when we put in the bandwidth as assumption very strictly and try to fit everything properly we'll see we can definitely talk about energy in the energy or power of the n of t itself okay so at that time we'll make it more concrete and all that but for now let's take it as level of pst okay so let's try to write it in terms of these two quantities which are definitely measurable in my transmitter and receiver so you can put a power meter or something of the signal that you're putting out you can definitely know what es is there's no doubt about that likewise you can also know the level of the psd so these two are realistic quantities that i can relate to in a physical system okay in my model also it's good to relate everything to these guys okay so let's see what happens okay so the probability of error works out as what 2 1 minus 1 by m okay q what okay so let's try to write this in the denominator i have root en okay so no problem the numerator i would have yeah root i think it should be 3 something no 3 es by m squared minus 1 is that okay okay so another way to write it is 1 minus 1 by m q root 3 by m squared minus 1 i will call i will first def i'll define this quantity for the first time i'll call it signal to noise ratio okay so that's my snr okay it is signal to noise ratio to be es by en okay so it's very clear why this quantity signal to noise ratio is so crucial okay because my probability of error is a function of the signal to noise ratio and not es separately and en separately okay so es by en is what really matters to me okay so that's why i've been saying always it doesn't matter you can pick a d arbitrarily okay as long as you allow n not to be arbit i mean you can fix your d and then let your n0 be arbitrary okay if you do that what can you get you can get all possible snrs if you can get all possible snrs you can get all possible probabilities of error so your trade off is not limited by that in your model your trade off is not limited by keeping d as a general d okay you can pick d gen d fixed but what should you do you should allow n0 to vary as long as you allow n0 to vary it's okay okay so this quantity is very very crucial and you have to pay attention to this in all your design then Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So, he's right. So, what he's saying is, in reality, you might be able to tweak only some things. I'm not talking about what I can tweak. Okay. So, I'm trying, trying to tell you, whatever you tweak, I can model that just by this. Okay. So it's just in the model. In the model, it's enough if I fix d and vary and not. If you vary things in some other way, you'll give me some SNR right ultimately and my probability of error is a function of only that snr i can achieve that same snr with a different setting here it doesn't matter only the snr matters okay so that's the reason for fixing d arbitrarily as 2 or something okay so that you, you don't have to worry too much about all these 
variables floating around. But if you want to have a D, you can have it. It just doesn't make any difference. Okay, so it's the same thing. All right. So SNR. So, but like he points out in reality, what will happen in the receiver? So I'll tell you how the receiver will work. You know, you know, you're going to put a power amplifier at the transmitter and you're going to pump it. Okay, so it's going to go out. And the receiver, usually you put something called a low noise amplifier after you filter out some things. You put a low noise amplifier, and after that you'll get your signal. Okay, so that signal will have a certain energy. That is my ES, right? At the receiver, it'll have a certain energy. That is my ES. So maybe based on your power amplifier setting at the transmitter, based on your low noise amplifier setting here, you can vary the power a little bit. That's how it will work. Okay, but typically there will be a tar target power level after the LNA, which will be which will have to be met. LNA is by the way low noise amplifier. Okay, so you have that limit. Okay, so that's how your signal power will work. So you won't know what your D is, right? It's very difficult to know what your D is. You can figure it out by doing some processing at the receiver. Okay. In general, if you don't know how far your transmitter and receiver are separated by, you don't know all these settings, it's not possible to know an exact D, and you don't have to know it. You only have to know the ratio. Okay. So all these things don't matter too much, right? But you can figure out the D using some careful signal processing at the receiver. It's possible. Okay. So that's the that's those are the things to keep in mind. So all these models are nice in your head, but in practice they will come up in a very different way. Okay, so you can plot the constellation and all that and figure out how it works. Okay. Anyway, so this expression is very very crucial. When m is large, you can make a very convenient approximation. What is that? You can say probability of error is approximately two times q root three SNR divided by m squared minus one. Okay. All right. So, so I want to I want to point out the first of all the simplicity of this expression. Okay. Well, there is the Q function which you can't get a good handle for, but again think of it as e power minus x squared. Okay. Q of x is of approximately e power minus x squared. So it's an exponential fall. And look at the simplicity of the expression. It's got probability of error on the left hand side, a quantity which you really really care about. And inside the Q argument, you've got the other two quantities you care about. Okay, in fact, maybe three quantities, power of the signal, power of noise, and the rate that you're transmitting. So in just this one simple expression, all the trade-offs are accurately represented. Okay, so, so that's the power of modeling things in a very simple way. Okay, if you don't want to do that, if you want to take all the complications of your transmitter and receiver in mind, hold on to continuous time and do all these things, you will never get a nice expression like this. Okay, so, and you will never understand how the trade-offs actually work. Okay, what happens when I double M? Okay, suppose I want to increase my bit rate by one. Okay, right? If I want to increase my bit rate by one, what should I do? I should double M, right? So what happens when I double M? It's a question that can be beautifully answered once you look at this expression. Okay. Otherwise, if you just you have to do too many experiments to figure out these things. Okay. So things like that are very crucial in practice, and that's how you answer. Okay. So that's another. Is it okay? Is, is this expression fine? Any comments? Okay. All right. So there's another related quantity which I'm going to define uh, as normalized SNR. Okay. So that's my definition. Let's just take it as a definition for now. Later on, maybe we'll look at uh, deeper meanings of this normalized SNR. So what's normalized SNR? Okay. I'll denote it SNR norm. This is SNR. This is for actually M PAM. Okay. This is SNR divided by M squared minus one. Okay. And you see the motivation is very clear. Why am I doing it? I just don't. I want to get rid of M. Okay. I want to normalize by SNR with rate. Okay. So that's my normalization. So you see SNR norm becomes uh, variable. Okay. So I'll, I'll make more comments. I'll show you some plots and then make a lot of arguments about why this is working out, why that is working out. Okay, so this is SNR norm and in terms of SNR norm and for large M, you see probability of error has this very, very simple expression 2Q root 3 SNR norm. Okay. Okay, I put equality here, so maybe you want to put it wiggle there to show it's approximately that all right okay so let me show you a plot of this hopefully this should work out okay 
Okay. Is this picture clear? Is it okay? Can most of you see it? So if the guys at the back can't see it, I'm not going to make any excuses because there are like tons of seats in the front and you're choosing not to sit in front. Okay. So can you see it? This plot is extremely crucial. Okay. Whatever else you don't understand, you should understand this plot in this course because every digital communication system today, one always provides a plot like this. Okay. So what do you have? Uh, well, the title is MPAM. So this plot is for MPAM. Okay. On the x-axis, I have SNR norm in the dB scale. Okay. And on the y-axis, I have probability of error, which I have called P sub E in what scale? Logarithmic scale. Okay. So one linear unit is 10 power. It's a, it's a detection by 10. Okay. You divide by 10 when you go down one linear unit. Okay. So it's that's the that's the logarithm uh, logarithmic unit and I have two curves there one in red and one in blue okay so the one in red is for m equals 2 okay and the one in blue is for large m okay so you notice it's okay right it's an okay approximation the approximation that we made by ignoring m even for very small m it seems to hold it's, it's roughly the same okay so all these differences it might seem like exactly not the same but in practice when you're dealing with the system these differences don't make much of a difference okay so they don't kill you all that much okay so it's not a big deal so you can you can accept that okay so so this point i don't know how well you can see it maybe if you're close you can see it this this point is 10 power minus 6 okay and that's a crucial point okay the reason is in most practical systems it's accepted as a rule of thumb that 10 power minus 6 is a very low bit error rate or bit error rate or error rate in general an error rate of 10 power minus 6 is considered very very good okay so at least symbol level symbol per symbol symbol error rate of 10 power minus 6 is definitely a very good point okay so where is that achieved okay roughly about okay 9 db okay so this point is roughly about 9 db 9 db of what normalized snr okay so you see the advantage in normalized snr what is the advantage though in terms of normalized snr why did i have to divide by m squared minus 1 okay now i can talk about this 9 db independent of m okay and well actual snr it's dependent on actual snr but i can talk about this 9 db as a requirement for 10 power minus 6 symbol error rate independent of m whatever m you have what should you look for your actual SNR normalized by m squared minus 1 should be 9 db for for achieving 10 power minus 6 probability of symbol error. Okay, so that's a good number to keep in mind. So what's db conversion? I'm assuming you've done enough db conversions in your head. So 9 db is roughly what? 10 times, right? So 10 times. 10 db is 10 times. Okay, so 9 db is also you can take as 10 times. If you only can reduce by 1 and say 9 times. Okay, so, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so there's another thing 3 db is considered two times so maybe it is eight okay so maybe eight is a good number for you okay so eight or ten times so what it says is what this plot tells you finally is finally it tells you everything that you need to do okay right suppose you know at your receiver you have a certain n naught by two you have measured your uh, measured your power spectral density as n naught by two okay in your transmit power and your lna at your receiver you have to keep knobbing moving the knobs till you have a signal power which is roughly 10 times if you if you are interested in a 10 power minus 6 symbol error rate suppose you are interested in a 10 power minus 5 symbol error rate what would you do yeah just go up and then find the related snr norm remember this has to be snr norm okay so it has to be normalized with respect to m squared minus 1 okay so once you normalize it it doesn't really matter this plot captures every single m pam that you can think of okay so that's the nice thing about this plot. Any questions about this plot? Anything, anything that is disturbing people? Everybody understood. So this is very crucial. If you understand this plot, it's okay. It seems very simple, right? So most people on the field, most engineers working on the field work with plots like this. Okay, so this is a language that's very understandable. Okay, and this 9 dB is a very realistic number, right? It's an actual number. So it's, it has a meaning in reality in a physical system. It's not just a number that you got from your <coughs> from your model. All right. So I'll tell you just to just. Be, I mean, I know this is too early, but 
even at this point you should know something okay so this 9 db is not an optimal number okay suppose i ask you a question how low can my snr norm be so that i can still achieve 10 power minus 6 is that a reasonable question to ask yeah you should ask ask that question as engineers right you want your snr norm to be as low as possible and still achieve 10 power minus 6 symbol error rate right is that a reasonable question to ask that's a very reasonable question to ask and that's a question you should ask in most systems when you evaluate it you'll have to find its snr norm and then find out how far it is from this optimal value what do you think that number is the optimal value of snr norm at which you can achieve 10 power minus 6 error rates just take a guess what do you think it can be since so it's 9 db sorry 3 db 4 db okay so in in 1949 when shannon published his paper on communication mathematical theory of communication he gave an answer to this question okay an accurate answer and that answer turns out to be 0 db okay in fact even 10 power minus 6 is not there the proof the way it works you can achieve arbitrarily low probabilities of error okay but it's not at the symbol level well it's also at the symbol level should they should i say that arbitrarily low probabilities of error can be achieved at 0 db normalized snr okay so it seem reasonable to you okay so if somebody gives you a plot like this and says hey i'm at 9 db i'm doing 10 power minus 6 what should you tell him well you're doing really bad <laughs> right that's what you should tell him reason is you can achieve that 10 power minus 6 at 0 db okay and this was known at the very start of the whole communication problem people were trying to solve this people knew that but it was very very tough and today we can get very very close to this number you can get like at 0.5 1 db or so you can get 10 power minus 6 very easily okay without too much of a problem okay so in one way the problem of digital communication has been solved you know we are we are solving a we are looking at a problem that's been almost completely solved but still there are some unsolved issues here and there and of course there are other areas related to it which might be useful for you okay so the ideas that are involved in getting from 9 db to 0 db are these powerful ideas of error control coding and all that so pretty much you have to pick a very powerful error control code and do that so that's where coding fits in but we won't see coding pretty much till maybe till the end of the class maybe a few examples okay so that's the power of this okay the reason i gave you this information is you should know that what we are studying right now is not the optimal thing it's just one way of doing it so optimal scheme will be a modification of this where you will introduce something called coding to get very low symbol error rates okay so that's the that's the theory there all right so something else i wanted to do yeah so one some some more computations in terms of actual snr as opposed to normalized snr okay so roughly you should know so this once you know this 9 db numbers you are comfortable with normalized snr but you should know what it means in terms of actual snr okay so that that we'll see one rule of thumb which is uh, which is quite useful okay so, so it's, it's very easy to see okay so i want you to think about this the probability of error expression two times q root 3 snr by m squared minus 1 so roughly for large m you can think of m squared minus 1 as m squared itself so the denominator works out works out like that okay so so what rate does this achieve okay so from a, a useful rate to think of is in terms of bits per symbol okay bits per well yeah bits per symbol i think this is good okay There's also a bits per dimension type quantity. We'll, I'll introduce that later. But anyway, bits per symbol is the is a good unit to have. Okay. So suppose I want to increase my rate by one bit per symbol. What should I do? I have to double my m, right? If I multiply m by two, I get an increase of one in rate. If I double by m by two to get the same probability of error, how much should my SNR increase? you see that do you see how i'm making this argument this is a very crucial argument okay so you see inside q there is an argument and that completely captures all of my probability of error okay when i want to increase my rate my 1 i have to double my m but i want to keep my probability of error as the same okay which means my snr has to increase four times do you see that it's a very simple argument but still the way it works out is is very nice to see okay 
so if I want to increase my rate by 1 increase rate by 1 I have to double M okay and to preserve my same probability of error SNR has to increase by how many DB increase by 6 DB okay so the 6 DB number is often quoted as a rule of thumb for doubling your signal constellation okay so or increasing your rate by 1 so remember all this is in a very simple MPAM situation the place for MPAM is no coding or anything it's just simple MPAM it's not optimal or it's just simple simple MPAM you do it yes Hmm. Okay, so it's possible to do that at very very low SNRs without coding. Okay, that's also coding one might say, but there's some one can think of it close to modulation. But yeah, any reasonable rate you have to do code. Okay, so so this is a good. Uh, good rule of thumb to remember ok so any questions you are ok alright ok so so a couple of things to do next is to go to m squared qam ok so you will see m squared qam and mpam are very very closely related and one probability of error completely pretty much controls what the other probability of error will be ok so that is uh, that's one thing so let me do that first and then I will do the other thing Okay, so let's do m squared qam okay so so what's the constellation constellation oh, oh my goodness okay my constellation is actually made of two different MPAM constellations. I'm, I'm going to only draw the first quadrant. Okay, so you fill out the other quadrants if you're interested. Simply draw the first quadrant. Okay, so that's my m square qam. I have say d by two, three d by two, have minus one d by two. Likewise here d by two. And minus 1 d by 2 okay so once I assume all my points are independent okay right once I assume all my points are independent my x-axis and y-axis symbols are also chosen independently I can think of an mqa m squared qam symbol right symbol x as 2 pam symbols this is a PAM symbol MPAM symbol and this is a also an M PAM symbol and once I assume all the M square points are independent these two will be independent as well so in my detection I can detect my I channel separately using an MPAM detector and Q channel separately using my MPAM detector again. Okay, this is only if I assume they are independent. Okay, if I don't assume they are independent, then the whole decision regions will change. It's it's a big headache. Okay, so but it's very common to do this. Okay, so even if you know they are dependent, it's just common to finish this off, and then take care of the dependence in some other way. Okay, so for instance, I've been talking about coding. I want to briefly point out when you do coding, this dependence will be independence will be lost. Okay. But people typically make a suboptimal decision and take care of the dependence in the decoder for the code. Okay, so that's how it works. Okay, but anyway, for now, let's assume it's all independent. Once you assume it's all independent, there's no big deal. You don't have to build a separate M squared QAM detector. Okay, you just build two MPAM detectors, one for your I channel and one for your Q channel, then run it through. Okay, so your probability of error will be controlled by probability that either X1 is in error or X2 is in error. Okay, and those two are simply probabilities of error for the MPAM detector. Okay, so this is a very simple way for the independent case. If it's not independent, what do you have to do? Find the actual 
decision regions in two dimension right which is quite complicated okay if you are not independent you have to take care of the probability you can't do ml anymore if you want it to be optimal right you have to do map okay so if you do map for optimal detection it becomes more complicated all right so anyway so let's write down probability that x bar is an error okay this will be what okay yeah so the way i can write it is 1 minus 1 minus probability that x1 is an error squared is that okay right so this is the probability that either x1 or x2 will be in error assuming they are iid right iid distributed okay so this is the probability of error for m squared qam this is the probability of error for m pam is that okay all right okay so let's uh, let's write down uh, probability of error for m squared qam it's going to be 1 minus 1 minus what did we know probability of error for mpam is 2 times q d by 2 divided by root n not by 2 square okay so this is again rough because I'm not taking care of m. If you want to take care of m, it will be 2 times 1 minus 1 by m. Okay, so I'm ignoring that. Okay, so once again, ignoring certain terms, this will roughly be 4 times q d by 2 root and not by 2. Is that okay? Okay, what term did I ignore? Q squared I ignored because I know it's going to be e power minus. So if any reasonable value, it's going to go much faster. So I can ignore it. Okay. All right. So now we have to do the conversion back from D to ESN EN. Okay. So I'm going to say EN again is N naught by 2. There's no problem there. For ES, I have to be slightly more careful. What will this work out to? 2 times M squared minus 1 D squared by 12. Is that okay? Okay. What will be my rate? <laughs> 2 times log m base 2 bits per symbol ok so those are my various quantities of interest ok so now if I go through and do a conversion what does it work out to probability of error for m squared p a q a m ok I am doing all kinds of I think my bracketing is gone uh, it's got all kinds of errors ok so it doesn't matter say all brackets match each other ok this is for m squared qam works out what the 4 outside is, is ok you know I mean it doesn't change it doesn't even play a role in my trade off arguments for SNR and all that ok so inside there will be a small change what will it be Three by two, so square root of. Give me, don't don't normalize. Three times. Three by two SNR by m squared minus one. Is it okay? Okay. Okay. So you see, this is small. Uh, small change in the way the Q works but it's okay I mean it's pretty much the probability of error for the PAM okay, it's not a big deal so don't have to worry too much about this in terms of expression so even here if you want to say increase your rate by 2 okay if you want to increase your rate by 2 so sort of you want to add 2 bits per symbol then you have to double M and when you want to double M you pay a 6 dB penalty okay so that's okay those are things you can do. 
you can plot this but typically this is not uh, it's not a big deal okay so you can see why mpam is more fundamental okay so it's much more fundamental than the way this is going to work out. okay so 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 the next thing i want to do is do a similar calculation for m psk or m squared psk and compare it with m squared qam and see if which is see which is better so for instance he was asking a question if i have two different types of constellations right instead of just independent signaling with constellations how do i decide which is better yeah that's an important question to ask right you might you might be given several choices and you have to make a choice of constellation if you given two different constellations how do you choose which one is better so the way to do that is, is a very similar approach so you go through and find probability of error in terms of these q functions okay and simplify it come to a certain stage where you can write it as just one q function with a certain type of an argument okay do it for both schemes and simply compare the arguments of the q functions and you will know the answer okay right so it, that's the that's the trick to doing it and that's an important thing to know also okay so if you do for say i'll do for mpsk okay so if you go ahead and do it what i'm expecting finally is probability of error for mpsk it's a little bit more difficult okay so those are eight regions are i mean the decision regions are a little bit different and you can't split it into Two MPAMs. Okay, so you can't do that, right? M MPSK. How does it look? Right, it's going to be on the circle. Okay, all these points. Okay. Okay, so you can't, you can't nicely split it into two different things that are independent. So you can't do anything simple that way. So it'll be a complicated expression, but you can do a series of simplifications and. Uh, I'm not going to write down the final answer right now, but you'll have some constant q square root, right? S N R times some other constant. Okay. Okay, this constant will not really matter unless these other things match. Okay, this constant will not really matter. It's not a big deal. And then by comparing this constant with the constant you had for the other case, you can decide. which is better okay so it turns out you can make a simple decision right so for instance if m is 2 psk will agree with 2 pam if m is 4 4 psk will be the same as 4 qam it has to be the same right 4 psk and 4 qam are the same but when you go to 8 psk and say 16 psk 16 psk and 16 qam 16 qam will be better okay so we'll see that okay so i'll give you the expression maybe we won't even see the derivation the okay, derivation is a little bit painful and there's lots of approximations there okay so i'll just give you the expression for the next class and uh, we'll stop here okay